Today we're going to open the Bible and I want to show you five keys to reading and interpreting the book of Revelation. Uh, so many of the thousands and thousands of viewers write in and many times I hear people who are struggling with all of the various views, all of the various opinions, and uh, they're genuine, wanting to be good students of the Word. And so today's study is vitally important because today's study will provide what I would like to call theological guardrails. And I want to show you five incredibly important keys for reading, understanding, and interpreting the difficult book of Revelation. I openly admit it. It's a difficult book for many, but it is understandable. God would not have given us the book of Revelation if it was not understandable. Uh, it just requires some guardrails to help us, and we're going to provide that for you today. And one of the things that I think will be of great benefit to you is these same keys for reading and interpreting the book of Revelation will help you with other books of the Bible as well. If I were teaching at a seminary or if I were teaching today at a Bible college, I would like to teach that to all incoming freshmen in their first semester and in their first week. I think one of the most fundamental things every new believer, every established believer can add to their arsenal of scholarship skills is everything has to be built upon how do I read, understand, and interpret. And so that's our focus today, five keys to reading and interpreting the book of Revelation. Let's go into the book of Revelation and the very first chapter, and let's begin reading at verse 1 and reading down through verse 3. How I love this book. Bible in the book of Revelation and the first chapter, verse 1 says, and by the way, I'm reading out of the New Living Translation, this is a revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the events that must soon take place. He sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant, John who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is his report of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Verse 3, God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church, and he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says for the time is near. Let's take a moment to pray. Heavenly Father, once again, as we open up the holy and the sacred scriptures, we bow with true humility before the awesome holiness of God. And we recognize that without you, we are nothing. But you also stated in the Bible that through Christ, we can do all things. And so we ask you today to anoint our minds and help us by the Holy Spirit to be led into truth. I pray as we share these five important guides for reading and interpreting the precious vision, which is called the book of Revelation, the last and final book in the closed canon of Scripture, that you will encourage people and equip people I pray that they might never be afraid of studying and delving deep into the truth of God. I thank you, Father, for each and every one of them. I pray for them today and all of the thousands in the days and weeks ahead that will come across this teaching. I pray most of all that they would live ready every day to meet the Lord. We know that you're coming soon, over 400 times in the Bible, we are warned that Christ will return. Help us to live in such a way that is pleasing in the eyes of God. Cleanse us from all sin. 
and anything that hinders our relationship. May we draw closer to you. We pray for friends and family that they might also come to know Jesus Christ. And now I ask for all that might be listening that you would give them the patience to the very end. For if they do not know the Lord or are uncertain as to where they stand or they have wandered away from faith, I pray that today would be a day of homecoming for them. Draw them back to Christ and I pray that they would live from this moment forward every day ready to meet the Lord. And we ask these things in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, Amen. Uh, I love that third verse. I've shared it with you over and over again. But if you're one of our new students, uh, the book of Revelation is given with an incentivizing promise that we do not find in any other book of the Bible. There is a supernatural blessing promised to all who study the book of Revelation. And so those of you who through the weeks and months and years have studied the book of Revelation and Bible prophecy with us and other great passages and doctrines of Scripture, be reminded today that the book of Revelation carries a supernatural blessing. And we find it in verse 3. God told us in the very infancy of this book, that he blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church and he blesses to all who listen to its message. That's you. There is a supernatural blessing from God promised to you for being a patient, diligent, responsible student of the book of Revelation. He blesses all who listen to its message and... Obey what it says, for the time is near. Let's get right into our study because I have much ground to cover. If you're taking notes, number one, the first key to reading and interpreting the book of Revelation, number one, read the book of Revelation with humility. Before I delve into the other four that are more systematic and more academic, I want to begin with an attitude because attitude oftentimes determines what God does in our life and what God uh, sometimes cannot do in our life because of bad attitudes. But sadly, there are some who approach the book of Revelation with an arrogance and a know-it-all attitude And this is something that God is never pleased with. So the first key to reading and interpreting the book of Revelation is to read it with a spirit of humility. Let's just be honest. The book of Revelation is not an easy book to read. Now, I have studied it uh, pretty much my entire life. Since I was a child, my father was a pastor, and uh, had the privilege, and believe me, I count it as an incredible privilege to have a Christian mother and a Christian father and to be raised uh, in the presence of God and in church and in the fellowship of God's people. And my father as a child used to bring prophecy teachers in from time to time to hold special meetings. But I became, before my teen years were completed, I had this interest in Bible prophecy in the book of Revelation, its counterpart in the Old Testament, the book of Daniel, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. The prophecy of the Bible was important in the early part of my own walk with Christ because it gave me evidence. Because sometimes we make the mistake in the faith to tell people what to believe without telling them why we can believe it. And as a young man having, and I still do, I, I have a, a, a mind that works through what some people call analysis and synthesis, which simply means I like to see things taken apart and put back together in a way that makes sense. And if you've never had questions about the Bible, you've never studied the Bible. And so prophecy as a young Christian, finding my own way in faith, 
Prophecy and Bible prophecy was important to me because it was provable. And that's why I spend so much time <clears throat> talking to you in our studies about provable things in prophecy. Now, do I have strong beliefs about prophecy? Of course I do. But both student, don't miss this, both student and teacher, when it comes to the book of Revelation, must always have a spirit of humility because the book of Revelation is not the easiest book to read and to interpret. I always tell people, avoid individuals who have an attitude about teaching Revelation. I call it, you know, Revelation made easy approach. And there are plenty of people like that. They come to the book of Revelation and they, uh, you know, try to break it down. Let me give you a classic example. I actually received on my iPhone this morning uh, a video and uh, it just came up on my phone. Of course, our phones uh, have uh, intelligence, artificial intelligence, and they listen to what we say. And so your phone figures out uh, what you like and you'll get advertising and, and, and you'll get suggestions uh, along what you enjoy. So needless to say, many times on my iPhone, things pop up that pertain to scholarship and theology and in particular Bible prophecy. This actually happened. I am not lying. This morning, a video from a well-known ministry that will remain unnamed. Their video was entitled, a YouTube video, Understanding the Book of Revelation in Five Minutes. I kid you not. The title of their video was understanding the book of Revelation in five minutes. Now, the very title should tell any competent Christian that is a teacher that should be avoided at all costs because anybody who tries to take the book of Revelation and turn it into a quick and easy approach methodology is not the kind of mentor or pastor, or spiritual leader, or teacher that should be of interest to you. You're going to have to approach the Bible and the book of Revelation with humility and a teachable spirit and be willing to learn. And I promise you that will not happen in five minutes. The other thing that I would want to caution you on is to be very cautious of teachers and those who approach the book of Revelation and prophecy that have all of the answers and all of their answers are perfect and they as teachers are not teachable. Uh, they are locked in and they're argumentative and they're forceful and they're dogmatic and they're unbending. Any quality spiritual teacher worth following should approach the book of Revelation with an admission, as I often admit to you, I'm admitting it to you right now, that there are certain views and certain interpretations in the book of Revelation that have been debated throughout the centuries by incredibly devout, intelligent, academic minds. Do all Christians throughout all church history agree on all of the details of the book of Revelation? No, they do not. Now, we should be firm enough in our convictions if the weight of Scripture supports something. It certainly is not out of line to say, uh, I believe the weight of Scripture strongly supports, you know, ABC or whatever it is that you're teaching and talking about. But I, under this first key of humility... Be cautious of people who try to give you a, a book of Revelation in five minutes overview. Be careful of teachers and mentors and spiritual leaders who also are unbending and harsh. And anybody who doesn't agree with me is demeaned and so on. That is not the proper way to approach the book of Revelation. Another caution, be careful of those who promote themselves as experts in eschatology 
or experts in Bible prophecy. It has been said, and it is probably true, that no true expert needs to call themselves an expert. And usually those who claim to be experts, you'll find with time, they rarely are. So always be cautious of a self-promoting Bible prophecy expert. We all should be learning together with the spirit of humility. Always read Revelation with a teachable spirit. Don't miss what I'm about to say. All of us, including myself, there should always be a willingness to change our view if the weight of Scripture bears out something that we may not have previously understood. And so if somebody has a different position, we shouldn't attack them if they hold a different view. For example, there are some who believe in the rapture taking place before the tribulation, which I strongly believe. There are some that believe that the rapture takes place halfway through the tribulation. There are those who believe it takes place three quarters of the way through the tribulation. Some who believe in it taking place after, post-tribulationless, after the tribulation, and so on. There are various views. If somebody has an opposing view, the first response should never be to attack them or demean them or call them stupid or say, you know, your view simply is not held by intelligent people. And uh, now I'll be quick to say there are some views that are so far away from Scripture. And uh, I just have to be honest with you. I, I see many people... Uh, it becomes obvious to me within five minutes that they really are not true students of the Bible. They've been to some seminar and bought a couple of tapes or CDs or DVDs, and, and now all of a sudden they want to present a view as if they've been a student of it for four decades of their life, and they just learned it one hour before they had a conversation on Facebook, and they're demeaning, and they're arrogant, and they're not willing to be teachable. Always be willing to change your view if biblical evidence is found to support such a view. And then one more thing under humility is ask God to direct you to a ministry gift that has dedicated their lives to the study and the proper interpretation of Scripture. This is a common mistake that is amplified because of social media. Social media is filled with many talking heads who are really not prepared nor qualified in many circumstances to be teaching the Holy Scriptures. So ask God, because God does give you ministry gifts. Listen when I tell you this. Resist the tendency to be independent. By that I mean, don't just take the Bible in your hand. I actually had someone that wrote the comment. We should never listen to men. We should only listen to the Holy Spirit. Somebody just wrote that just days ago. And uh, they were commenting about individuals on one of our uh, YouTube videos that had over 100,000 views and had several hundred comments. And uh, this person uh, was making comments, you should not be listening to this man. We should never listen to men. We should only listen to what the Holy Spirit tells us, and we should never listen to men. Well, that's simply not biblical. God has given ministry gifts to help the church, to teach, to equip, to correct, to guide. And it's not that those individuals who are given callings by God, anointed by the Spirit, to fulfill certain biblical gifts are above error. But God certainly will reveal to you ministry gifts who have proper attitudes and proper scholarship. Uh, open with me into Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And go down to verse 11, and let me read to you through verse 13. 
Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. Highlight that. Christ gave gifts to the church. And then it announces what those gifts are. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, that is my particular calling, the pastors, and teachers. Those are five ministry gifts that God gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. And those ministry gifts were given throughout the church age. In other words, they weren't just for the first century church, they were given for the guidance and the strengthening and the advancement of the kingdom of God throughout the church age. Verse 12, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. So this is of utmost importance. You must be humble and teachable as you come to the book of Revelation. It should be a part of your prayers. It's a part of my prayers on a regular basis. Lord, I humble my heart in your holy presence as I study the book of Revelation or whatever I'm studying. I ask that the Holy Spirit guide me into truth, correct me if I'm wrong, bring people into my life who can help me become a better student of the scriptures. Then rule number two, interpret Bible prophecy literally. I'm going to back that up. Rule number one, we have to approach the book of Revelation. When we read it and want to interpret it and understand it, we must build upon the foundation of humility and a teachable spirit. As I already said, number one is attitudinal. You have to have the right foundation, the right spirit, the right attitude if you're going to allow the Holy Spirit to be a part of teaching you the things of God. These last four are theological and hermeneutical. Now, hermeneutical is just a seminary word or a Bible college word. Hermeneutics refers to the proper interpretation of Scripture. Uh, I'm currently chairman of the board of North Point Bible College and Seminary. All of our students have hermeneutics one, hermeneutics two, because how we learn to interpret Scripture, those that are going into full-time ministry, one of the most important things that is learned is how do I properly open the Bible, read the Bible, interpret the Bible, and communicate the Bible. So these last four guardrails on how to read and interpret the book of Revelation are theological and hermeneutical. These are things that uh, if I were teaching you in a classroom setting, uh, these are of utmost importance. So number two, interpret prophecy literally. Interpret prophecy literally. The dictionary defines literal as belonging to letters. I've always found that definition quite interesting as well as provoking. When we talk about literal, it comes from a root meaning to belonging to letters. It also says that literal interpretation involves, quote, based on the actual words in their ordinary meaning, not going beyond the facts. Now, I want to give you a gold nugget. Don't miss it. Of all of the five keys to reading and interpreting the book of Revelation, this key is the essence of all matters. Do not miss it. 
literal interpretation is the essence of reading and interpreting the book of Revelation. Now, when I speak of literal, uh, literal interpretation, it's sometimes also referred to in classrooms as normal interpretation. It is important to clarify and define not only what is meant in the book of Revelation, but equally important to understand what is not meant. And sometimes one of the keys to learning what is meant is to eliminate what is not meant. Uh, a respected scholar by the name of Dr. David L. Cooper states what has uh, been known as the golden rule of interpretation. Why don't you write that down in your notes and I'll go over it slow enough so that you can include it. The golden rule of interpretation. Quote, he said, when the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense, period, end quote. Let me give it to you again, and that truly is a gold nugget in hermeneutics and interpreting the book of Revelation and other books. When the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. He went on to add, take every word at its primary, ordinary, usual, literal meaning unless the facts of the immediate context studied in the light of related passages and axiomatic, uh, axiomatic is an adjective that just simply means uh, self-evident. Let me read that last sentence again. Unless the facts of the immediate context studied in the light of related passages and axiomatic and fundamental truths indicate clearly otherwise. Now, there are three filters that we use to examine what Dr. Cooper meant. And I would also ask you to include these in your notes. When you're reading and interpreting the book of Revelation, there are three filters that you should be examining your reading through. Filter number one is called the grammatical filter. And that simply means read and understand according to the proper rules of grammar. Very simple. The second filter in reading and interpreting the book of Revelation is called the historic filter, which simply means do not exclude the proper history of what the author is reading and who he is speaking to. And many people are oftentimes guilty of that. You'd listen to some people who teach on the book of Revelation. You'd think the entire book of Revelation was written from Donald Trump forward. You would think that everything in the book of Revelation was specifically for the United States and the Beltway and the Capitol and Washington, D.C. and Democrats and Republicans and so on. My friend, that should be an absolute red light for you. If you hear anybody teaching the Bible and they are trying to take the historical, contextual, grammatical writings of the book of Revelation and point it at modern days. Now, there are things in prophecy that address modern days, but the book of Revelation was not written to support nor to destroy American politics. You have to understand its consistent historical setting if you're going to understand what it means for proper application today. And the third filter, obviously, is the contextual filter. We have to always read Scripture in context. We can't take verse 3 out of a chapter and build an entire dogma or doctrine on a single verse that's not consistent with what that verse is written in considering its context. And I've taught you this over and over and over again, but it bears repeating. We have uh, 
hundreds, sometimes over 2,000 uh, recently new students in a single month. So those of you that have been following us for years, uh, pardon me for reiterating some things that are absolute foundational truths, but that's how people learn is by repeating it and reiterating it over and over and over again. When we read the scripture, we read text within context. For example, if we're reading a verse uh, in chapter 7 of the book of Revelation, we have to read probably chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8 to get an overview of the context from which the text we're reading comes from, and then we have to examine it by the overall narrative. You need to read the entire book of Revelation. At some point in your life, if you're a serious student of the book of Revelation, you need to sit down and read it in one setting. Start at chapter 1, verse 1, go all the way through the end, and set aside some time to read it in full narrative. So those are very important filters that we use in reading and interpreting the book of Revelation. We have the grammatical filter, we have the historical filter, and we have the contextual filter. The literal fulfillment, I love this, pay careful attention. The literal fulfillment of past prophecy means that we should interpret future prophecy to be interpreted literally. Write that down. Let me give it to you again. The literal fulfillment of past prophecy, the literal fulfillment of past prophecy means that we should interpret future prophecy to be fulfilled literally. Now let me just give you a quick quick example of that. When we study the Old Testament, and let's just use for an example the prophecies concerning Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah. When we read the prophecies of Jesus Christ, His first coming, His birth, the details of His birth, His child-rearing, His nurturing, His ministry, His death, His resurrection, His ascension, etc., All of the things that were prophesied about Christ in the Old Testament were fulfilled literally in the New Testament. So that provides a rock-solid foundation and strong argument for the literal method of reading and interpreting the book of Revelation. Uh, Dr. Gordon Fee in the world of academia, he's... Uh, beloved and an icon. He actually passed away uh, on my birthday, just uh, the 25th of October. Great man of God, and he was the uh, longtime, highly respected president of Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, which is literally just down the road uh, from uh, North Point Bible College and Seminary, where I serve as chairman. As a matter of fact, we have a cooperation uh, with student bodies concerning libraries. They have access to our library. We have access to their library. Many of our students have taken some courses there and so on. Great man of God, uh, full gospel, Pentecostal in his beliefs. He passed away, but I've read him through the years in some of his writings. And in one of his books, he reminded me of the importance of discovering original meaning in studying scripture. And he wrote this, quote, As with the epistles, the primary meaning of the revelation is what John intended it to mean, which in turn must also have had meaning to its readers that could have been understood. In other words, Dr. Gordon Fee was saying, to understand the book of Revelation, we have to understand it in light of what it meant in John's day in order to understand what it means in our day. Uh, Very powerful, very basic, but that, my friend, is solid gold as well. To understand the book of Revelation, you need to understand what the author of the book, John, 
what he wrote and what it meant to the people in his day. Because if you don't understand the book of Revelation from John's perspective, writing it to the people of his day, then it will limit how you interpret it in our day. That's why those who try to take the book of Revelation and tear it apart to fit political narratives or uh, some other type of dogma that deals with the 21st century church and they have no understanding as to what John was saying to the original church. The seven churches mentioned there in those first few chapters, uh, the last mention of the church, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 22 until closing salutation. But if you don't understand what John was saying in his day, then it will impair you in reading and understanding what it means in our day. Number three, when interpreting symbols, look for a literal reference. And perhaps nothing is more confusing to the new student of the Bible and the new believer and those who are studying the book of Revelation for the first time is the interpretation of symbols. I would quickly admit that perhaps the most difficult aspect of interpreting Bible prophecy in the book of Revelation is understanding what all of the meanings of the symbols are. For example, uh, the book of Revelation talks about horns and beasts and stars and various colored horses and on and on. There are symbols found throughout the book of Revelation and a lot of new believers and even seasoned believers, they get to the symbols and the symbols become the roadblock for them. They just can't get over the hurdle and they just close it up and say, that, you know, that's just one book I'll never understand. Please don't have that frustration with the book of Revelation. It is vitally important to who we are currently. So it's critical at the very outset of understanding the book of Revelation that when symbols are employed in the book of Revelation, you will usually find a literal definition as to what the symbols are. For example, when we read of the seven stars in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 16, we just have to read down a little further into Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20, and it tells us that those seven stars are seven angels. And so the symbolism, if you're not reading again, not reading in context, just reading a text, finding a symbol in a text, getting frustrated and saying, you know, I'm done. That's just too much for me. If you would just carefully and prayerfully read in context, you'll oftentimes find that the Bible in the book of Revelation goes on to define what the symbols are. When we read of the seven lampstands in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 13, we read a little further in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20 that the seven lampstands are the seven churches. When we read of the morning star in Revelation chapter 2, and verse 28. We read in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16 that the morning star is Jesus Christ, and so on. So just a few examples that the symbols are oftentimes a roadblock for many people. They get to the symbols and the horns and the beasts and the colored horses and, and the seven stars, and they just go into meltdown and they assume that they'll never be a good student of the book of Revelation. Well, let me help you and let me encourage you. I don't care who you are. I don't care how bad you did in school. I don't care how low your self-esteem is. Stop that right here, right now. We're drawing a line in the sand for you. From this day forward, you take on the identity as to who you are in Christ Jesus. And the Bible said in the book of James, if any man, and the word man from the original Greek text is generic, it means male or female. If any man or woman lacks wisdom, let them ask of God who gives to all liberally. Once you become a born again Christian, the Bible said put on the mind of Christ. So quit comparing what your mind was like in elementary school or junior high or high, high school or you dropped out of college or you failed this or you failed that. Stop that. As of today, stop that. 
from this moment forward, you are a son of the king. You are a daughter of the Most High. And God will help you physically, mentally, spiritually, intellectually. Your path with God always goes up. Some of you have just never exposed yourself or submitted yourself to a good spiritual mentor. That's why I oftentimes say, and I hope it is uh, communicated with true humility because I mean it to be as such, but I would like to be a trusted source of learning Bible prophecy and learning the scriptures in your life. And I pledge to you that I'll always do my best to help you go from where you're at to where God wants you to be. I want you to be a good student of the book of Revelation because we're living in the final moments of human history and you need to live ready every day to meet the Lord. And it's going to take some time. You'll never see a YouTube video. You'll never see a podcast. You'll never see a Facebook Live from Evangelist Tiff Shuttlesworth that's entitled Learning the Book of Revelation in Five Minutes. Anybody who tries to tell you that you can absorb the complexities of the book of Revelation, you can't do it in five minutes, you can't do it in five hours, you can't do it in five days, you can't do it in five weeks, you can't do it in five years. I've been studying the book of Revelation diligently for four plus decades, and I am still a teachable student today. But you can hear me. You can learn the fundamentals of the book of Revelation and end time prophecy so it becomes a map in your hands to help you navigate these last days. When we read of incense in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 8, we read that incense is the prayers of God's people. So when you see symbols in the Bible, always look for a coming definition, an explanation. And you'll find that many times it is literal. It refers to something literal. Uh, also important is numbers in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 1, Jesus taught us that numbers are to be interpreted literally. There are seven lampstands and seven stars. And Jesus then went on to tell us that these refer to seven literal churches. And so even when it comes to numerology, when you're reading the book of Revelation and you come across symbols, look for literal interpretation. When you come to numbers in the Bible, look for literal interpretation. When the Bible speaks of a thousand year millennial reign of Christ, it is a literal one thousand years. Again, look for literal interpretation. Number four, interpret scripture by scripture. And this is true not only of the book of Revelation, it's true of all of your Bible study. Interpret scripture by scripture. As we interpret scripture by scripture, the prophetic picture will become more and more clear, more developed, and more complete. Now, what do I mean interpret scripture by scripture? Well, when you find a truth in the Bible, when you read the entirety of the Bible, you will always find things that support that truth in other places. The Bible has no contradictions. Don't ever forget that. There is no contradictions in the Word of God. And so what Daniel taught us in his vision in the Old Testament, many of the truths of that are found as counterparts in the book of Revelation. What Paul wrote to the churches in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians in talking about future events, the rapture of the church, etc., we find other passages that support similar things. When Jesus talked in Matthew chapter 25 and gave to us the parables there, those can be found and interpreted with other passages in the scripture. Interpret scripture by scripture. Again, going back, we never take out a single text. Like, for example, there's a passage in Ezekiel that talks about 
the two wings of an eagle. And many times through the years, people have said, well, that refers to the United States of America and the U.S. Air Force airlifting Jews and bringing them back to Israel. Well, that's simply not true. Uh, we can find by taking Scripture with Scripture that in other passages we know exactly what that is. But that's why we have these absolutely unlettered teachings that are available and flood us in social media. Please, I know I warn you about this all the time, please be careful as to who you listen to. Quit listening to videos that are forwarded to you from people you don't know. Discipline your time. Whatever you're going to do concerning the learning of Scripture, discipline your time to listen to trusted scholarship. Listen to people who have integrity in their scholarship. And quit listening to people who are trying to take prophecies in the Bible and attach them to American politics or, or a specific type of plane in the uh, Air Force. And those types of things should be major blinking red lights that you're not going to learn the book of Revelation or prophecy in proper context. Especially true with Bible prophecy, let Scripture interpret Scripture. And then fifthly and lastly, be careful to distinguish between fulfilled prophecies and unfulfilled prophecies. You have to remember, if you're going to be a good student of eschatology, if you're going to be a good student of end time events, one of the things that I'm teaching you now, tuck it up here, don't ever lose it. There are multiple prophecies in the Bible that have already been fulfilled. And there are multiple prophecies in the Bible that are yet to be fulfilled. And so the proper reading and interpretation of the book of Revelation, you must always have that as a guiding examination point. There's fulfilled prophecy there's unfulfilled prophecy, and carefully distinguishing between what has been fulfilled and what yet remains unfulfilled is a key to accurately interpreting prophecy and putting together what I oftentimes call a prophetic outline. So the first step is to read the passage in its context determine if the specifics of that prophecy actually occurred already in the past. If the entire prophecy or some elements of that prophecy have not yet been literally fulfilled, then based upon the biblical pattern of literal fulfillment, then we should expect that in the future it will be literally fulfilled fulfilled. And so these are the five keys to reading and interpreting the book of Revelation. I hope that you'll mark this video, maybe save it. It's a video that you probably should listen to at least three times or more until it really begins to like breathing in and out a normal part of how you pick up the Bible and how you read the book of Revelation. And so this teaching will be available on YouTube. It'll be available on our podcast channel. It'll be archived in our Facebook videos. Share it with someone. Many of you have Christian friends that are new in the Lord and they've never had guidelines and guardrails taught to them. And they're always off in the weeds about Bible prophecy and some psycho's newest video that came out on how to understand the book of Revelation in five minutes. Be a friend to them. Be an encouragement to them. And instead of being mean-spirited, just point them in the right direction. Say, here is a video that will give you sound biblical understanding on the keys to reading and interpreting the book of Revelation. And as we follow these five guidelines for interpreting prophecy, then you'll find that it'll be much easier to arrive at clear,
consistent interpretations of future events that are predicted in the scripture. But make no mistake, if you're going to read, interpret, understand the book of Revelation, it does not bypass consistent study, diligence, dependence on the Holy Spirit, a teachable, humble spirit in the presence of God, and be careful that you always have a humble attitude. Because if you study prophecy long enough, there will be people who will disagree with you on something. Many of them will come at you with a bad attitude. They've listened to videos like how to understand the book of Revelation in five minutes, and they want to correct you. Don't be mean-spirited. Just realize that you're dealing with people who, as Paul said, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Uh, and ignorant is not a bad word. It simply is a word from the Greek that means they haven't been taught. Sometimes you just have to realize that you're dealing with people who have had no teaching or worse yet, they've had poor teaching or heretical teaching. And don't demean them. Don't fight with them. Don't argue with them. Just make up your mind. You're going to be a humble diligent, prayerful, consistent student of the scriptures and of Bible prophecy. And I hope I can be a trusted source in your life to help you fulfill that goal. I love you and appreciate you. I never close a time of teaching without asking you if you're ready to meet the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 400 times in the Bible, it's prophesied he's coming again. If you're not right with God or you're away from the Lord or backslidden, receive such a beautiful testimonial today from a husband and a wife. And the letter basically said, we are so thankful that we found you some time ago on YouTube and began to listen and wanted you to know that we have both dedicated our lives to Jesus Christ and we study the Bible with you faithfully on a regular basis Pray for us, and please know we pray for you every day. Are you ready to meet the Lord? Do you know that you have dedicated and consecrated your life to Christ? Will you pray with me if you have any doubt whatsoever? I'm not here to condemn you or heap guilt upon you. I want you to be ready to meet the Lord, and He's coming soon. When you're done praying with me, go to our website. It's on the screen, lostlamb.org and click on New Beginnings. New Beginnings. And follow the prompts. And get in touch with me. Write me an email. It encourages my heart more than you'll ever know to know that there are people who are finding Christ and coming back to Christ. If you need to do that, pray with me right now. Just say, Heavenly Father, today I recognize my sin and I repent. I confess my sin. And in faith, I turn my back on sin and today turn my heart to Christ. With the blood he shed upon the cross, cleanse me now. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Keep me ready for your soon coming. In place of my weakness, fill me with the power of the Holy Spirit. And keep me steady and stable on the path that always leads upward. Today I vow I will serve Jesus Christ all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Mm -hmm.